Hey friend, it's me Vasco with a quick announcement. We at the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast are organizing this year's Scrum Master Summit. For tickets and details on the summit, check out the URL bit.ly forward slash SM Summit 22. All one word S-M-S-U-M-M-I-T 22. And now on to the show. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our TGIF and Product Owner episode this week with Luis Carvalho. Hi, Luis. Welcome back. Hi. Good morning, everybody. Very nice to be here. So, Luis, we talk about Product Owner today, and obviously we'll we'll end with a great example of a great Product Owner. But just to get us started, to get us warmed up, and to understand a little bit better your perspective on the role, share with us what might have been, Luis, the worst Product Owner anti-pattern you've seen in your career. Yeah, so so the one that I've seen, which I think had the biggest impact, I, I'm not sure if it's the worst antipathic or not, but the one that I've seen that that had the biggest impact was uh, also again in a big consumer product that, that we were building, and we got a, a a product owner for for our team, but he never really saw himself as as part of the team. So we were treated a bit like a, a supplier or uh, an entity, an external entity of sort, which we're basically getting getting requirements from him and we're basically going to roll it out and let him know when it is done. So he, he kind of externalized a little bit himself from the team, but it was kind of the worst of both worlds, right? Because as we were doing Scrum and as we were doing Agile, he also felt that many times he didn't really need to be prepared for a lot of ceremonies. So I, I remember things like we, we used to do continuous refinement. So instead of taking like one or two days, we would take a chunk of the day, right? It helped us to be time box more, more, more efficient. And sometimes we would take one hour a day for a refinement. And we were able sometimes not even to get through one story because there were so many questions. There were so many things coming in, so much feedback from the team that we weren't even a, able to do that. And on top, whenever things didn't go well, whenever there were delays or something like that, it basically would just throw the team under a bus, right? So it's a development team. They're not speeding up. They're not up to speed. That's uh, a great way to destroy a relationship. Very much, very much. Yeah, so he basically would, would detach. Again, he treated us a bit like a supplier. Here is the work. This should be done in two or three spins. If it's not, then I'm just going to point a finger at you. And of course, this, this caused a lot of friction. Uh, also, the team started to get very defensive. We wouldn't have that; they wouldn't have their back, so to say. Uh, they would also hide behind the, the the so to say the requirement. It really became almost like a bad customer supplier relationship. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I, I'm, of course, because the moment you start finger pointing, you start throwing up the shields, right? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And, and it came to such things like he would slip requirements or updates under the radar. So in comments, for example, we were using Jira and you had the story and we started to work and we just put in there in comments just to say, look, but it's written in here. I remember once this was really, really funny. I wanted to save the ticket, but I didn't get it. Just for posterity, we had over 3,000 comments in the Jira ticket. Um, so it was getting it was getting a bit a bit uh, ridiculous, uh, so to say. But again, I, I think it was again also a consequence of psychological safety from him, and I, I think also uh, he, he came in too strong because he was new. He, he wasn't a senior PO; he was new, and he was also new for the organization. And he came in too strong where he should have been a bit more more uh, defensive in the work that he was getting and and trying to 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 ramp that up. Yeah, and it kind of highlights the as as we were talking about the relationship between teams on Tuesday, right? It brings up again that aspect of needing to build the personal relationship first, and only then go to the details of how we work, and you know, details about you know what do you expect from me, what do I expect from you? This is not well done. This is not well done. Whatever that is, right? So it's maybe even a recurring pattern that we see in our role as scrum masters, the need to build that positive, uh, constructive personal relationship before diving into the details of the day-to-day work. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. We, we miss, for example, to have a team agreement with him into behaviors that we, we were okay with, behaviors that we weren't okay, and, and sometimes even to understand his pain points. So I understood his pain points, so I worked with him in, in a lot of ways. So 
So for example, okay, we worked a lot into the, into the structuring of this refinement and how we will get work to the team so that it wouldn't be so disruptive and frustrated a little bit as well because he was caught between, he, he felt a bit trapped, right? Because he was under pressure. Things weren't going well. Whenever he would try to convey work to the team, there were 100 questions, things weren't moving. So he felt a bit trapped. So I helped him out a bit into that. And I also helped him out in terms of of, of managing bad news with the organization, right? So many times I was even involved directly or some team members directly into, into these sessions, into these, these meetings, sort of also because we had the big picture, like, okay, this is delayed, but we're, you know, you can't do A, but we can do B and we're going to tackle this, I don't know, by a manual process, this kind of, you know, trying to, to give, not that they're good news, but to give the context and to show that it is being worked on. It was not just a, a mishap, right? Things as such. But still, many times, again, whenever he, f- he would feel threatened, the old behaviors would would uh, come about. That's another thing that we really need to take into account, right? Like we need to be able to detect when people feel threatened because that is a very big hint that something needs to be tackled, that, that some safety needs to be created to talk about the psychological safety you already you already referred to. All right, but Luis, now we turn our attention to the opposite, the mirror image of this. So share with us what might have been potentially the best product owner you've ever worked with. It was two product owners after this one that I just mentioned. So we moved on into another role. We had one interim, but was was for a very, very short time. And then this this new PO came along. And it was like night and day, to be honest. Okay, probably also because we had such a bad experience with the with the the older one. This kind of highlights or enhances or or, or catalyzes this good experience that we had with this new PO. But it was really like a, a breath of, of fresh air. So he, he was a proper product guy. He was a really really product guy. He wasn't much of a process kind of you know story slicing these these kind of things uh, he was really really a product guy which was okay for us because we were a very mature team in ways of working so we knew how to do this by ourselves um, and I, I think one of the great things that that he had done uh, I, I think two things so one is he had his own kind of also product delivery pipeline his own board so things like product discovery new ideas, fresh big ideas that he's going to. So he really gave the team a very good sense of direction, right? Again, the, the why, why do we exist? What is our North Star? But also materializing this with what he had in mind. Like, okay, these are ideas that I'm having, but I'm still, they're still in the oven. These are ideas that I'm already looking into implementing. But for example, now they're still under user testing and things like that to understand if they're viable, but then I will ask you guys for help. And then these are the more solid ideas. So we would always share with this with us constantly, which again made us, uh, you know, we always had a big sense of the product. We always had a big sense of what we were building. And also in decision-making, this was very important because we could make decisions based on what we know now, based on, on our North Star, but also what is coming in, right? So we implemented like A or implemented like B. Let's go for A because... Uh, we had this thing on the pipeline that might be coming through and it's really going to help with that and it's going to make our life easier. And the second thing was that he never saw things in sprints, right? So the way that he, he used to communicate was through functionality and it will get done when it gets done with the trust that the team is doing the best to get to there. So it doesn't matter if it's sprint two, sprint four, or sprint five. He would say he would have a functional roadmap, right? So the product is going to do this by then after this is going to be due, you know, with no timelines, right? And this was our objective, was functionality. And that really, really uh, took the, the, the time pressure out of our backs, also helped him for the stakeholders because he was showing moving parts, right? And that kind of eased the question. What do you mean by moving parts? Can you explain that? It was much more focused on on really that, that, that uh, um, analogy of, when, when you're building, for example, a motorbike, first you build like a, a, a moped, then you build a bicycle, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, he was able to show really in small chunks progress. And he would, because he did this functional roadmap and not big releases, he was able to show progress 
uh, to stakeholders, but moving working progress. So he was. You're talking about being able to talk about a roadmap as an increment of functionality over the existing product, rather than these big, you know, milestone releases. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And he did this at the micro level, but also at the macro level, uh, which meant that again, every two weeks, he always had something new to show, uh, which was very good for feedback. Though big organizations feedback. Sometimes it takes more than more, two weeks, right? <laughs> more than two weeks. But one very good thing that it did is it showed progress, right? So, and a lot of stakeholders, particular finance stakeholders, basically they ask, okay, uh, how much is this going to cost, and when am I going to get my my return on investment, right? And they they deal with a lot of projects like that uh, because they they are worried. That's why they want dates. They are worried. But if you show them progress, if you show them things moving. And at some point, they say, look, if I mean, if we want to launch tomorrow, we can launch it just this, right? It's missing A, B, and C that we think is still uh, important for our MVP or for our first proposition, but we, we, we can launch because we always have a working product. That's something that he always instilled with us. We always have a working product, and we don't break that working product. If we break it, we stop, we fix it, and then we go about our lives. So that he, he really brought this this product mindset into the team more than the scrums and the backlogs and the slicing and et cetera, et cetera. Also because the team can do that on their own, right? Exactly. So he adapted very well. So we said, look, I'm not going to add any value for you guys to do this because you guys can do this better than me. So I'm going to give you the thing that you can't do. And that 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 was a great relationship that we had. And And because it is framed that way, the team can also see what's in it for them and can collaborate and can help the PO. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great example. Maybe even something our Scrum Master friends out there can use to frame the next PO coming into their teams, you know, show them this episode, have them listen to it, and uh, then work together on the working agreements that uh, Luis referred to a moment ago. Luis, we're getting close to the end, unfortunately. But before we go, do share with us, where can we find out more about you and the work that you're doing? You can go to my LinkedIn page, so to say. At the moment, I, I'm working in a Portuguese scale-up. But, but sure, so you can meet me at my LinkedIn page or in some, some meetups. So particularly here in Portugal from time to time, we don't have as many summits as, for example, in London or in other parts of the world, but we do have a couple. And typically, I, I always join. So if you want to meet me, just whenever you are there, just on the guest list, look for Luis Carvalho and give me a ping. Absolutely, Luis. It's been a pleasure. I will put the link to uh, Luis's uh, LinkedIn page on the show notes so that uh, everybody can go there and ask him follow-up questions, maybe clarification questions as well. So do do interact uh, and give feedback to Luis about his week here on the podcast. Luis, it's been a pleasure. So thank you very much with your generosity, with your time and your knowledge. Yeah, thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure, Vasco. All the best. Hey friends, it's Vasco again, now with a bit longer announcement. I'm part of the team that is behind the Global Scrum Master Summit, the conference dedicated to the Scrum Master role. If you're a Scrum Master, the Scrum Master Summit is the place to learn, to share, and of course, to meet new friends. We will have lots of live sessions where you can meet and network with other Scrum Masters from the whole globe. So make sure you check it at bit.ly forward slash SM Summit 22. We have several amazing key notes and seven tracks that feature people like you and of course thought leaders sharing their insights their knowledge and helping you become an awesome scrum master you can check out all of the details of the summit including the keynotes announced the track chairs and much more at bit.ly forward slash sm summit 22 that's all one word that's bit.ly forward slash sm s-u-m-m-i-t and the numeral 2-2. I'll see you on the conference floor.